So I'm going to go on to introduce our next keynote speaker, who is Margaret Chapman Clark. Um, Margaret is a chartered and registered occupational psychologist. Uh, she's an existential humanist psychotherapist and an applied researcher and an award-winning author in the field of emotional intelligence, mindfulness and compassion at work. She's an acknowledged pioneer in the field of coaching psychology and has spoken nationally and internationally about strengths-based coaching for mindfulness-based EQ. She served on the board of trustees for the world-renowned leader in the field of mindfulness for depression, the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, and contributed to the work of the all-party parliamentary group and the mindfulness initiative at a time when there was an explosion in the interest in mindfulness at work. She's a passionate champion for organisations fit to house the human spirit and in developing compassionate resilience to enable science-based practitioners, including surgeons and surgical trainees, to flourish. Margaret, we're delighted to have you with us today and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Is that the right, the right sort of pace? Shall I... Uh, I want to say hi, it's a really interesting experience. I'm noticing that talking to my screen and I'm wondering about how many uh, people are out there in different parts of the world. So I want to say hi, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you um, my reflections in preparing um, my presentation. It probably is very different um, to what you've been covering. I, I came in and the last speaker's presentation of their paper and uh, still managed to notice some very relevant uh, observations from Mark about the notion of expectation. So I shall kind of pick at that up later. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen, if that's OK, and talk about what my uh, offering to you is today. OK, so I have um, considered how I wanted to position my contribution this morning. The theme is very much about flourishing as a plastic surgeon. And so I'm uh, using this uh, analogy of stories of Kintsugi. Now Kintsugi is the art of reparation. And I think that was very pertinent to what I have to share and in terms of your specialism. So what I, I intend to do is to invite James and Rebecca, who will be very much participants and co-collaborators this morning in sharing their stories. Because I, I wonder how often, I mean, I'm a scientist uh, practitioner and regularly attend and speak at symposium and conferences. And I want to stop and think about what do we mean when we talk about symposiums? So I, I took some time to reflect. And the obvious one is there's a conference organized by experts around a topic. It's also an opportunity, a space to share case studies, to consult, to engage in dialogue and to learn. And when we look back, even at the Greeks, in ancient Greek, Greece, it was around a convivial discussion after a banquet, which included drinking. A bit early for, for today, and uh, mind you, that's in the UK, it could be across the whole world. <laughs> Probably mine is about a water, but that's about the extent of mine this morning. It's also a title by Plato. However, today I'm taking a, a, a different approach and offering you a perspective that here and now in this presentation, this is about storytelling and above all, story listening. So why am I using the phrase stories and not case studies? We're all familiar with the notion of case studies, particularly at conference. And way back in my early research uh, days, 
Grab and Taylor said that really when they were making just an argument for mixed methods, which seems a long time ago now, but arguing as a third methodological movement, they noted that numbers convince policymakers and stories are more easily remembered. Connect with others and can potentially lead to less wasted information. While Daniel Stern, psychologist and psychologist, says that even in this present moment, this present moment contains the essential elements to compose a lived story. And he makes a distinction here between lived stories that are those that are formed in the mind but are not told, and a told story is a narrative with someone telling a lived story. Okay, so I'm going to uh, invite wherever you are in, in the world to let's experiment with Stern's idea of the elements moment. So I'm going to invite you to pause and to, in fact, take a mindful pause because this will be inviting you. So if it's okay, wherever you are, and it might seem strange if you're in a public office, <laughs> to really stop. And I'm going to invite you to become aware as you sit in the chair or if you're standing, just to be noticing your feet on the ground. And this is by invitation, because I'm aware that it may not be comfortable or appropriate where you are, but if it's okay to gently close your eyes. And I'm going to invite you now, as you close your eyes, just to become aware, to turn the attention to the breath, to your breathing. As it rises and falls. The full cycle of the in-breath and the out-breath, not looking to change that rhythm in any way. Stop, focus on the breathing. And as you do that, I'm now going to invite you in your mind's eye to move the focus of your attention to your mind. To notice the thoughts. I had a busy morning, exciting papers, inspirational stories. What do you notice? As best you can to try and not get caught in that story. And now I'm going to invite you to return to the breath. And after three cycles of the in-breath and the out-breath, to open your eyes, to reconnect, maybe a little bit of a stretch, gentle movement to bring yourself into the here and now. Okay. 
So what did you notice? <laughs> okay, suddenly realized this cartoon, suddenly realized how much the mind wanders. And bringing it directly to surgical trainee, who after that practice said, I recognized I had the attention span of an ant. <laughs> I'm hoping that five years later, at least she's uh, developed some uh, capacity for, for paying attention and noticing. Okay, so, so why stories? I've given you some of the, the, the science the, from my own field, but as Joan Didion, a literary uh, figure writes, we tell stories in order to live. Stories allow us to lead more reflective. Now I included that quote in a collaborative uh, text that I put together with pioneers really in the field of implementing mindfulness-based interventions for well-being. These were practitioners from within mental health services, from finance, fr from the media, from higher education, so a whole cross-section and health and social care, and social care uh, in particular um, were leading the way at that time. And really those are autoethnographies, they are stories of practitioners who are passionate about what they did, their calling, and yet they had self-doubt and met a lot of resistance. But rather than case studies, I invited them to share their personal journeys of how and what they felt in terms of their personal development and how that impacted on their professional practice. And I've worked now with junior doctors, specialist registrars, NHS leaders, occupations across the whole of the piece, including um, surgeons, surgical leaders, and surgical trainees. And initially that, that came from working as a senior fellow in executive education for Manchester Business School. And then in my practice, as a consulting occupational psychologist with a deanery in a part of the, the UK. And I was appointed to support at that time, which was a label that I rejected and certainly did not shape my practice, which was around doctors in difficulty. So over the years and working with clients on a one-to-one -one basis, there are three themes that I want to share, and I know that in the stories that are going to follow, three themes about stories of flourishing that have come from within my practice. The first is courage and vulnerability. The courage is about stepping into the vulnerability. It's not easy to engage and share stories of what become, at the start at least, a struggle. You know, from my observations, there's a lot of impression, what we call in psychology, uh, impression management. We've got to be seen to be a particular way as a, as a professional, as a practitioner. And certainly I've seen this within my work within the UK's National Health Service over many years. Second theme is that what supports them is this connection, the, prepar the, the willingness to connect in a one-to-one -one conversation because they come out of a commitment to their calling. And sometimes that calling may be brought into question. It's also a commitment to doing something. It's not a nice, cozy conversation. That can be a tough, um, I think the phrase one of my tutors taught me was about tough 
well. It's around voicing what might be uncomfortable. But in doing that, it raises awareness. And the third theme, in order to be able to step into vulnerability, to connect and stay committed, is what I've written about in my terms of my work with junior doctors um, in the trainee support service, is compassionate resilience. Compassionate resilience. And I'll say some more later. So one of my inspirations for today, was it was a great opportunity to revisit some of the writers, I think, who, who I, I find supportive in, in terms of my work. And Obi Polster wrote that stories, that every person's life is worth a, no a novel. And he also asserts that stories must not only be told, but also heard. So this is my job to offer a space for dialogue where individuals can tell their stories to discover talents, strengths, and individual gifts that really, I have to say, in every situation, in every consultation that I've worked with across the whole piece from trainees through to NHS leaders, there are talents that go unnoticed that are taken for granted, often dismissed or that are simply out of awareness. So coaching really then is a place for storytelling and story listening, a co-constructed narrative where clients can really restory their lives. It's also a place that I've not only observed, but I hope that I can facilitate is individuals finding their path with a heart and particularly as I share one of the stories of Gisa, that path changed in terms of her speciality, which I'll come on to. So coming back to stories then, and this part to, to hear stories of, clin of clinicians who have worked in a one-to-one -one basis, who I've really, without knowing, have said, if you want to know me, then you must know my story. For my story is who I am. And if I want to know myself to gain insight into my own life, then I too must come to know my story. And that's in a text by Dan McAdams, The Stories We Live By. So I'm hoping now um, that James, and Rebecca uh, are ready to share their stories. I think they, they've uh, said to me it could be around five minutes each and we're doing okay for time. I'm, I'm trying to you know, pace it, recognizing that not every internet connection <laughs> is the greatest. So is it okay, James and Rebecca, for you to, to take the space and share your story. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I will start say a few words and then we'll move on to James. So um, during my training, uh, there were times when I felt really quite overwhelmed with what was expected. And I definitely was always very motivated to be a plastic surgeon. And I had certain strategies that worked for me very well of just working hard. And I think I came to a point where there were lots of pressures on me with uh, family. So I was living away from my family. In fact, the day that I got the keys for the flat that I was due um, to move into with my husband was the day that I then had a five minute look at it and then got in a car to drive up to Nottingham and live in a narrow boat for four years. So uh, I struggled a lot with uh, family and the balance between work and, and um, my family who were all in the southeast. And um, I found that I became quite miserable, really. And um, it was very difficult to decide what was important to focus on in terms of all of the, uh, the necessities that needed to be done in terms of 
audit, publications, surgical, technical skills, reading, um, and still finding a sense of purpose. And I had some coaching in the early days of my um, uh, recognized registrar um, training. And I've continued to actually have uh, coaching ever since. So I think initially when I had it, I was definitely labeled as a problem trainee. Uh, that word was definitely used to me. And um, I found coaching to be something that would make me think about what it is to be human, uh, but also to work in an environment where lots of things are expected of you. And that tricky mind, um, the way that my mind used to work in those days would very much be, uh, for example, if I didn't, someone didn't answer a call, I would say, he's ignoring me. Um, and actually, the, what I learned through coaching is there's other ways of interpreting somebody not calling you back. Um, I think that uh, what I've seen in trainees that I'm looking after at the moment, I can recognize in myself that we are juggling a lot of things. And sometimes it's very difficult to see what is important and what is not. So I think just slowing down, and I noticed the pace at which Margaret talks is really quite slow, but we live in frantic lives where we are running around trying to remember to do too, too many things, or so many things, that things are coming in and out of our heads all of the time. And sometimes communication can be a really big problem and it can lead to conflict. And I just think there's a lot to be said for slowing down and thinking what is important. Um, if you are doing a difficult case and you get maybe three different calls about things you're meant to do all at the same time, you really have to slow down and think logically in a time that is quite stressful. I think the other thing is um, our lives at home are very much related to our work. And with these um, very vocational jobs that we've sorted out, we have to balance our families. And I think, um, as Dr. Sabapathy spoke about in his talk, things only get more complicated. So we need to become more resilient and increase our skills as we go through. Uh, those of us that have got children are then trying to mentor our children, our trainees, and um, it is a real challenge to thrive. Um, but I think that um, it's something that uh, we can just continually be building on our skills. And uh, I would very much encourage trainees to be open to um, thinking in different ways and um, considering coaching, formal or informal, and considering open discussion with uh, those in their teams and outside their teams as well. I'm going to let James say something. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, that was incredibly courageous of you to share all that. And um, so, um, well done. And now you're, I think it's important for people to know that you are a what, fourth year consultant now. Yes. A stone man developed, just so that we can put things in perspective. I think I, I um, sought out coaching, actually. I had a very different um, experience. I sought out coaching towards um, the, the latter part of my um, registrar um, training career. So I'm now a, um, in my second year as a consultant. Um, and there were two main reasons why I sought out coaching. One was because I felt a bit lost. I was doing lots of things. I was doing research. I was doing um, my clinical stuff. I started a um, small family. Um, and I felt like I was doing lots, but I wasn't particularly going anywhere. So, um, uh, so that was um, one big thing. And the other thing was um, I had one of the things that I really believe in, and I think most miraculous in life, is that we always have a, we can always get better at something. And I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I felt like I, I needed to be better as a person, as a um, father, as a husband, as a um, doctor. Um, and I realized that a lot of the C-suite um, people, in other words, the chief executives, the CFOs, and uh, all these um, um, people who run big international corporations all have coaching. So I thought, well, why not go and find out what my blind spots are? So if they are revealed to me, perhaps I can um, use that as an opportunity to better myself. And that was a, um, a good, time to do it because I was coming towards the end of my training. Uh, and so I guess, um, let me just share um, quickly um, a couple of things that I've learned about myself because um, that, uh, this might resonate with um, 
people's experiences. So my story is that um, I was um, the second of um, four boys to, um, uh, um, to a couple who were both educated in the UK, but I was born in Hong Kong. They went back to Hong Kong um, um, years ago. And then um, my dad died when I was um, six, I believe. And so his dying wish was that um, my um, my mum took us to the UK where we would get educated here. So she did that unbelievable woman. And um, and as you can imagine, um, we struggled a bit as a, as a family. And um, but, you know, I'm sure my story pales in comparison to many others. Um, and um, but through that experience, I, I think um, I very early on developed a um, raison d'etre, which is to uh, make make my mum proud. And that that to, to this day, a large part of me lives for that. But it was important for me to acknowledge that and, and understand it. The second thing is that um, despite the you know the struggles and the challenges and the excitements of growing up in that kind of um, arena. I was incredibly fortunate. I never went hungry. There was always a roof over my head. Um, I had people who loved me. I had my family and I had an education. So, so I always felt a sense of responsibility and a need to give back and, um, and to touch as many people's lives as I could. Now, uh, you know, I knew these things about myself at a subconscious level um, and I'm sure I would have worked it out, but um, the coaching experience allowed me to be able to articulate that and come to terms with it um, much earlier. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a seismic shift, but that slight shift in thinking suddenly put a lot of things into sharper focus. Things became richer. Uh, and suddenly I um, found, I was able to find a purpose, which is what um, something that uh, Dr. Sebepathy was um, um, explaining to us, the difference between goals and um, purpose. And so through that, I was suddenly able to understand how I could use my career as a vehicle to express myself as a person, person what I stood for, my values and so on. So, so those are two of the things that I, I felt really helped um, with my development as a person. I think um, what I'd like to add just is that sort of having been through a process of being coached, uh, it enables me to coach my colleagues and James certainly has coached me a huge amount and it's interesting that he mentioned making his mum proud because it made me realise that's actually one thing that drives me and we're all very complex personalities and we have a different take on things and I think that's one of the great rewarding things of working within a team, the way that we all have a slightly different perspective uh, and it also brings with it challenges. Thank you. Okay, I might, you can hear me now again. I've come back in. Yep, I'm not on mute. <laughs> I'm accidentally muted myself. I want to really thank um, James and Rebecca for their courage. It's not easy, as I've uh, observed and experienced, working with high performing, highly qualified. Um, scientist based practitioners and I use that term really because I think it's quite distinctive as one uh, as I'm in that field as well I think we do need to be convinced typically by evidence and it's been a big theme as we know in the current climate so hearing personal stories it doesn't mean necessarily seismic is he is James. It's something about the, the world view. So that it's 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 a little bit like delicate operations. You know that. You know, it's a very much fine tuning who you are in the world. And if you notice in the stories, there is something about values, what's important to me. Rebecca talked about the real clarity, her metier for becoming a plastic surgeon, for James to make his mother proud. You know, these are very much, and I, and, and I had a suspicion, I didn't hear Dr. Sabathi speak this morning, but 
for me, the core thing is, as you, I'm going to share with you now, um, a third story, which is Gisa. Now, that's not her real name because of confidentiality. And we worked together as I prepared this presentation. Her voice was very much part of what I'm going to share with you. Um, it's Gisa. So if I apologize, I understand that a Tibetan um, name is old, and uh, um, why that's important, uh, uh, I'll pick up later. So the reason that I wanted to share with uh, you Gesa's story is that uh, I what started working with her in 2011, and I'll just go back. Um, I'll stay there. And I started working with her in. Well, actually, it was 2012 we finally um, connected. And that first consultation, we met in a busy out of town in, uh, office on an industrial estate. Gisa arrived late for our appointment. She was telling me it was something about, she didn't drive, and it was something about navigating the buses from the city to reach the business park. She appeared to me confused, disoriented, and absolutely diminished. And when I sought her permission to share that with you, she wrote, the confusion and disorientation reflected my sense of feeling lost in the complex maze of the NHS. Now, Gisa was born and grew up in uh, ne Nepal. She had no friends or family in the region. And it was, as I said earlier, as if her physical presence embodied the long trajectory of medical training, of assessment, of rotations, en route to her chosen speciality. This, however, the speciality through our work together was later to change. As part of my work with her, I recommended to the deanery that she be transferred out of region. It's quite a brave, brave on my part to step outside of my typical way of working. But now some seven years later, I recognize that what the story was for Gisa was integrating her way of being, who she is in the world, her, her values, her beliefs, her expectations, and what she was doing which she changed from one speciality to another, in which now she is enjoying a period of integration. So on this when I, I reflected, I wrote up my time with her as a professional case. And this is the interest perspective when we offer our professional take on something, our narrative and our clients. And she said, and I, I thought it was for me, her taking back control of her story. And the title of this slide, Stories Can Be Rewritten and Retold, comes from her. It's her title. And she says, I'm not sure really if I've taken control. Instead, I feel like I have given those difficult years a new narrative. I read somewhere that without intelligence, kindness is a folly. And without kindness, intelligence is callous. 
I tried to balance the two in order to successfully complete the foundation years and subsequent training in my speciality. And she says, this continues to be my primary approach to this day, largely inspired by our work together. And also being reminded of growing up in Nepal that one's experience cannot just be located or limited to oneself, that we're always in intricately connected to others' thoughts, feelings, and stories. Now I'm going to slightly move away from my didactic um, style and I'm actually going to read a poem. Now this poem was written by somebody called Bethany Morgan who's given me permission to, to share this with you and she created this out of a, an expressive writing process that I developed called Playing with Nine Words which I developed actually in research um, to capture the lived subjective experience of coaches who were developing their practice by incorporating mindfulness. And this poem really you know, aptly reflects my work at the start and at the end with Gisa. It's called Loss and Self-Compassion. Loss and self, loss and death challenged me. I was broken. My pieces lay in a floor in a thousand shards, like broken a broken vase. Self-compassion is the glue to fix the shattered soul. In Japan, they fix broken pottery with gold. Kintsugi. You're probably starting to get a sense of how the analogy of the art of reparation and Kintsuki and Kisa's story resonate with your practice as surgeons, surgical leaders, surgical trainees. And here again, I want to share Gisa's reflections as she looked back on, on how our work and her little poem that she, she wanted to share with you. She said, I remember one of the most important moments when I was walking was to my pottery class. I think it was the culmination of many of our sessions, our sessions, an awareness that the story doesn't stop. I felt a sense of relief I could be free. And in recounting a particularly difficult ARCP outcome, which actually prompted her to take some time out and go solo traveling, she wrote as she departed, tell me everything. I hear your truth. I see your beauty. So fear not, drop the doubt and bon voyage. So I'm going to bring us back now to um, some of the science. I know that uh, Rebecca is particularly familiar. I think she's given a presentation on um, the positive psychology, which is uh, an emergent field of um, psychological practice that looks at those factors that enable us to flourish. And this isn't, again, it's, it's often we dismiss as if it's something touchy and feely, and it's certainly not. I mean, one of the directions that really positive psychology has gone is much more, much more harder science, so less on me as a qualitative researcher interested in narrative and story. Just think about those stories that we've heard. Martin Seligman, in his book 2011, suggests that flourishing is based 
on five factors which have subsequently been investigated with some positive outcomes, which is around what he calls PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. So the five elements are positive emotions. All too often we do focus our attention on what isn't working, and that's by virtue of your profession and my own. Yet in my practice, I look at the strengths. I'm also interested then in the E is engagement. Can you think of a time when you were absolutely absorbed in that clinical setting, that flow experience? Sadly, the research shows that there are very few occupations where individuals do experience that flow, that sense of being absolutely absorbed and not noticing that the time has passed. We heard in all three stories about the importance of relationships, of connection. And in the current crisis in the environment, having a support network is absolutely key. And this morning you heard about the importance of meaning. Meaning isn't the same as goals. Meaning is more about your metier. What it is, is your calling. And again, I'm going to, to, to revisit that later on. In Gisa's story, for example, we discovered that the direction she was going on in terms of her speciality was not one of her choosing. It was not nourishing. It was depleting. And so she took the step stepped into the courage not only to relocate but also to relocate in terms of speciality taking time out to reflect on that the a is accomplishments this is what this morning has been about award winning submitting papers the competition that's there that's part of your field but what i'm going to add is the sixth element, which is the S. And it's about the stories, the narratives we construct about PERMA, about the positive emotions, about engagement, about relationships, and about meaning. I'm keen in my practice to enable my clients to find their voice, to use the words of a uh, Sufi poet, Rumi, which is to let the beauty of what you love be what you do. And to do this, I think you've got a sense of that we need to develop the capacity to both think fast and slow. To integrate what is in the literature, particularly around uh, mindfulness and the science of mindfulness, which is the two modes of mind, the busy mind and the still mind. We can, it's not one is better, one is, it's about integrating some of those parts that will be automatic, but we need sometimes to stop and to reflect and to use that extra time that working fast affords us. So, as I come to the end of, of, of my piece, I want to invite you to think about personal stories, the ones that you've heard, because words have power. Words can trigger varying responses and reactions. Words can destroy, inspire, and can act as catalysts for transformation. And again, remember, I'm right, I, I'm sharing this with you, partly because I work in this way, and you're getting a sense of that. But these are words that have inspired me from the people whom I have worked with in the clinical context. So it's about offering portals, words new words to offer new realities, new stories, as have been shared here. Stories that 
may be of difficulty of struggle, but ultimately it's a journey to flourishing. We heard how Rebecca talked of her, the label that was applied as those tra a trainee that was struggling. But as I've written about my view on that, it's around you have a long trajectory and life happens. It's about navigating the personal in the professional. So as they've grew, as James and Rebecca and Gisa have courageously shared, they've done so in the presence of what Martin Buber describes as an I-bow relationship. So there is hope amidst what feels like at the time in the present moment a crisis. However, and here is the caveat, whether or not a story becomes a tragedy depends on how the story ends. So I'm going to invite you as a result of offering my perspective from my work with peers, with leaders, with practitioners. What is your story in order to flourish as a surgeon that potentially needs to be told Remember the early distinction between a story in the mind and a story that becomes a narrative when it is told. What is the story that needs to be heard and retold? As Jesus' journey reminds us, stories can be written, rewritten and retold. So if I come back to my science perspective now, there is evidence from the fields of mindfulness, neuroscience, and positive psychology, that subjective well being and how we feel matters. Even economists such as Lord Layard have been advocating for training the mind to be both fast and slow story, to stop. And there I put STOP in large capital letters just for a, if you engage in a second informal practice of stopping the mind, taking a breath, observing what's happening for you in this, what's the story in this present moment, and then to proceed. So it's stopping the automatic pilot of the minds that you experience in the mindful pause. When we are still, and again, I've written uh, around this, this, this area, that when we are still, when we still the mind and we dwell, creativity does emerge. And if some of you want to get some more evidence from the field of leadership, Professor Ketster Fries has written a paper. He talks about Michelangelo and how many of his benefactors thought he was doing nothing for a very long time. And then he created a sculpture of David. So stopping is worthwhile because it enables us to choose the story. So in my final reflections, I want to come back to the three themes in stories of flourishing from my work with clinicians. You've heard today what from your peers and colleagues who've had the courage to be vulnerable. And that's not being vulnerable. Generally, it's with a purpose. And I think James's narrative really talked about that. He knew there was something. And for me, when he says he knew there was something, that for me as a practitioner is about a felt sense. We can't always articulate what that something might be. Yet in dialogue, in conversation, taking that personal courage to be vulnerable and share that is a purpose. And that's done in and with integrity. And they've done so because, and, and there's three stories today. However, I could, have, I could have shared many, many more. These are the themes. It's about a commitment to their calling. And that calling may not be the one that brought them into my consulting room. 
So there are difficult decisions. And that then, in order to that happen, to take action, the practitioner's stories are around developing compassionate resilience. And when I talk about compassionate resilience, we know a lot about resilience. I mean, it's been widely used, but compassionate resilience is a phrase that emerged out of my work with trainees in the early years of working with foundation doctors, registrars, consultants, leaders. It's about self-compassion, being kind to yourself. Remember what Pisa said about the importance of both intelligence and compassion. So we're coming back now. Why is it that I chose Kitsugi? It is, I know, a phrase that um, very much with um, Gisa. Um, Gisa means in Tibetan, golden. And often um, the Japanese art of reparation uses, as there's a picture there, a gold thread for a broken pot. So Kensuke gives the new life or rebirth to damaged or aging ceramic objects by celebrating their flaws and history. Living a Kensuke life is finding value in the missing pieces, the cracks and chips bringing to light the scars that have come from life's experience. It is about finding new purpose, maybe through aging and loss. It's about seeing the beauty of imperfection and loving ourselves, our family and friends, even with all the flaws, as in the repaired pot with gold thread. So for me, I selected and structured this narrative for plastic surgery is the art of reparation. This is what you do or are training to do every day. You can reconstruct parts of the human body. My well, okay, it might not be with gold thread, but nonetheless, the philosophy and the principles of Kintsugi. The outcome may not always be as is intended or can ever really be perfect. However, what you do is an art that gives new hope, new life, and even rebirth to those whom you touch. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank okay. You. So and hopefully within the, the time allowed and even some breathing space. Wow, isn't that a good model of fast and slow? You can still do it, even if you go slow within the time. <laughs> so quite a, quite a change from our usual talks that we have in these kind of forums, but very refreshing and extremely welcome. And we have got quite a few questions from our trade in the region, actually. So right. Start off, um, Rachel Howes, who's working with us at the moment, has just asked, what is the difference between a coach and a mentor? And what are the benefits and limitations of both? Yeah, well, it's interesting it's, um, because of my early days of doing research was, the, was around mentoring. So my very, very first piece of research for my master's in occupational psychology was looking at how mentoring supported personal development within the management um, development process. And that was very much in the mid 1990s. And mentoring has been around for many, many years. And it goes back to you know, historically. And mentors are seen very much as the, the wise, you know, that they've got the experience, they have the insight of maybe in the field. And I know that you have mentors and trainees have mentors. So there's something about almost like the apprenticeship model with a mentor. Over recent times, coaching has rapidly um, developed into a distinct field of practice. So um, I'm with uh, 15 colleagues established coaching psychology in the early noughties um, to bring what we knew about the principles of human development, professional development from psychology into coach and that's a different way of coaching 
than maybe somebody who's been through an executive coaching program. And that's quite important. I think that question is excellent because there are a lot of coaches out there. There are life coaches, there are executive coaches, coaching psychologists. So a coach will work with them a much more, usually, and, and, it, and, and I'll probably pick this up in a minute, is usually for a very focused amount of time. So for, for example, one other story I could have shared was of Anya, who was a young Asian uh, female, again, struggling with all the assessments, lack of confidence. And she found her voice through her creativity. And that was, she said, and we only had six sessions. And she contacted me, she, prepared, she, she created a picture that she was going to put on her wall she was a speciality reserve GP. She contacted me. Oh, out of the blue, she had qualified as a GP. She'd had only six sessions and yet had found through, actually it was another philosopher, Harry Clitus, I think it was, where she said, you can't step into the same river twice. And she, she, she created a picture, uh, which is in the book chapter that I'll reference. But coaching, very distinct time limited a mentor could be a coach because you work with them over a long long period coaching is focused like james's story very much identified worked with a coach then eventually if you work i've got some long-standing clients i feel the relationships more moves more to collaboration and i'm offering in my dialogue expertise from my perspective with my client who can then integrate. So there's a difference. There's a time difference. You can even have now one-off coaching sessions. That's a development more recently. They could be six, 12, and then they could, as I've got long-standing clients. In fact, Gita now, she usually checks in with me once a year, <laughs> although it's become a little bit more frequent um, recently. So does that answer the question or give you a perspective? So a coach can become a mentor. Um, so I've got another question uh, from another one of our trainees, Pip Drury, and she's asking about strengths training. Mm. Um, you noted in your introduction that you did uh, strengths coaching and with individuals and teams, and often strengths training is done in teams in corporate setting, and it's not something we commonly see in the NHS. And she just wonders, have you done strength coaching with any medical teams? And if so, what did you observe? And did it change <laughs> team dynamics? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how you perceive strength training. I mean, in my early days, I was also a fitness instructor. I do do fitness instructor now. And it's interesting, I used to do physical strength training. <laughs> but if we think about it in psychological strength, then I think it's, a, it's just really, it's a bit like James said, it's tilting our focus. We're often into our minds, and this is how come mindfulness has been so successful, is that our minds come back to um, uh, people like um, uh, those who write about compassionate mind, Paul Gilbert, that's who I was trying to think of. Paul Gilbert relates to evolutionary psychology, how that we've developed the capacity to think negatively because it comes back to our survival. And so we get triggered more readily for negative than we do for what works. So I've worked with teams where also using another approach called appreciative inquiry, and that is widely used across the NHS, which is strengths based. So we may work with a team to actually look at what are the strengths of the team and work with the strengths. So this approach has been developed to balance what we do as a species, which is to automatically go to the negative. You know, we're looking to repair. You, you, that's what you do in, in practice. But it's to actually balance. So it's possible, it's, you know, I mean, it is being applied within the NHS. Strengths-based approaches are being applied. And particular coaches, well, I, I for example, and I, I urge anybody listening to go to Martin Seligman's site, which I often do with my clients, because he offers free assessments and the one that I often ask clients to do is the VIA of character strength. 
so you can get your strengths as a team to be able to look at what it, what's the strengths and are there any gaps. So it's balancing. It's not. It's a bit like uh, that that diagram from Giza's story. It's about balance. It's not. But we've become a bit like that with the negative, and that's because it comes back to our evolution and survival. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Um, a general question from our consultant colleague Peter Pudney about bullying. How should contemporary trainees manage and flourish uh, through bullying? Yeah, uh, well, these are the narratives that really are strong within my experience of working with trainees because we are operating a hierarchical culture and it's very difficult for a trainee to have the courage that we talked about to voice because it's to do with power. So what I, I, I know, if I bring to mind now, as I visualize my consulting room in those days when I worked with a lot of trainees and it was very strongly, I would report um, through my monthly um, reports about themes that would, would be emerging and bullying and conflict. I've even acted as a mediator between very senior consultants in a trust. And I think it's about how do we empower the trainee to recognize and situate their experience within the wider. So like Gisa's story, she talked about the complexity of the NHS um, from her cultural background. And she described it to me once, uh, uh, the NHS being like a sick patient. Um, and, and we explored that as a, as a metaphor for her, her experience. And certainly bullying was so often, I mean, bullying for me, I've, I've researched bullying, looking at it with it is low emotional intelligence. So first of all, we need to develop the emotional intelligence of, uh, of, of surgical tra trainees in the early days. Uh, and I smile because you know the quote that I gave you about the surgical trainee who said that she had the attention span of a gnat. That was within a personal development program on emotional intelligence within their surgical training. So we actually brought in development uh, of, of emotional intelligence. And looking and thinking about the stories and of those, there's a, it's very complex. So often it's because there's a talent in potential trainee that maybe another more experienced colleague sees as a threat. And so it's around equipping the trainee to recognize the complexity of the system in which they're in and to have the resources, the coping, the self-belief, the confidence, and above all the self-compassion to know it's not always about them. And it's about the complexity of the system and how can they navigate that? and still have a voice. And I don't think it's easy, and I know it's not easy, but even the stories that I can think of in the early days, sometimes, you know, you've got to have a reality check. I think it was the uh, Mark's, uh, there was a question to Mark's paper about um, uh, what was the expectations of uh, positive, negative optimism. And then I, I immediately thought of my psychological response to that. Well, it's not either or, it's about a reality check. You know, there is a whole field of reality therapy. So for me, coming back to the basics, it's around equipping the trainee to understand the complexity of the system in which they're operating and to know what's, and to then equip them to know what's not acceptable and enabling them to make choices about what they do. And that is often be the, the case. And they may not choose to do anything, but they know it's not about them. It's that mm -hmm. person in an environment. And that's what occupational psychology is. It's a difference. Thank and you. that's why you know, I was appointed to the trainee service at that time, because they said they wanted someone who could understand the organizational psychology and the individual psychology. And so where did they meet? And how could you then equip? So I'd move wherever I needed to be, focusing the, the conversation. Thank you. Not easy, but it's possible.
Um, we have come to the end. Of the um, okay. We just had a couple of other questions about where people can seek out coaches or counsellors, and perhaps that's something you could give me some information on that I could pass on to them. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that because it's 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 absolutely crucial finding the right coach is critical. You know, like Kista says that if I I could have labelled her and I knew this at the time, that she was suffering from depression. You know, I could have used my CBT narrative, but I could recognize that this was in a human being trying to make sense of the world in which she was alien. And if I worked with that as a person, rather than a label, that makes all the difference. And so if you can find that kind of relationship that's so powerful. So yes, I'll provide you with a, 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 some materials that you can send out to, to, to all those of you who I thank for listening to my, um, it's very strange, this is the first time I've ever done a keynote by Zoom. So I look forward to uh, James and Rebecca's feedback on how I can uh, improve my performance <laughs> via this medium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Go, go well, everyone, and uh, good luck with whoever's going to, to win the uh, award. All right. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.